Dr. Hellman here. Are you taking care of the 72-year-old diabetic woman, first name S-U-E, last name Y-U? Yes, yeah, Sue U, but 13. I need a CT to rule out a diverticular abscess or perf, please. Well, I won't be able to rule out a subtle abscess or perf without contrast. Okay, so let's give contrast then. Well, you know her GFR is only 27. And she's at a really high risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. Is she really that sick? Can't you hold off on the CT until her renal function improves? I wouldn't want you to put this patient into worse renal failure. Hmm, I thought that post-contrast-induced nephropathy wasn't really a thing anymore. Tell that to the patient when she goes on dialysis. Well, uh, how about I give her some fluid, we give the contrast, and I have her sign a consent to treat form. Fine. Oh, and make sure to hold her metformin for 48 hours, and that she gets her renal function checked right after that. I'm Anton Hellman. And I'm Teresa Chan. I'm Justin Morgenstern. And I'm Rory Spiegel. And this is the Journal Journal Jam Jam Podcast. Podcast. For the first time on EM Cases, it's my pleasure to welcome onto the Journal Jam show a special guest, fellow podcaster and fomite, who's published a great systematic review on contrast-induced nephropathy, the one and only Dr. Lauren Westifer. So pleased we finally got you on the show, Lauren. Welcome to EM Cases. My pleasure. Awesome. So let's go back to the case that started off the podcast. So you've got this 72-year-old diabetic woman on metformin who comes into your ED complaining of left lower quadrant pain and fever. Vitals are stable, but she looks pretty sick and she's bumped her lactate a little bit. You highly suspect diverticulitis and you want to get a CT not only to confirm the diagnosis, but more importantly, to rule out an abscess or a perforation. She hasn't had much to eat or drink in the last 24 hours. Her creatinine is 210, which is up from her baseline creatinine of 180, and her GFR is 27. So before we get into the papers, we need to all be on the same page as to what we're actually talking about. Back in 2015 on episode 61, highlights from the Whistler conference, Anil Chopra reviewed what we knew about contrast-induced nephropathy then, and he defined it in the following way. One, that it occurs within one to three days of receiving CT contrast. Two, it's a rise in creatinine of 25% or more, or an absolute rise in creatinine of 44. So Rory, in 2017, what exactly is contrast-induced nephropathy, or more correctly, post-contrast acute kidney injury, what we'll call PCACI, or acute kidney injury from now on? So there isn't really any one consistent definition. The acute kidney injury network, or the Atkin definition, is at least one of the following within 48 hours after contrast administration. And that's an absolute increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, or for you Canadians, 27 micromoles per liter, or or a relative increase in serum creatinine by at least 50% from baseline, or a urine output, which is reduced to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for at least six hours. Wow. So, so, so far we've got about five different definitions based on what I was talking about in 2015 and what you're talking about now with the acute kidney injury network. Right. And, you know, no one has actually said on this one either. Some people think this definition is too broad and will include too many people. Um, and in fact, if you look at the studies we're going to go over, the definition changes from study to study. Studies have used relative increases by 20, 25, 30, even 50 percent over pre-contrast creatinine levels, while other studies have used the absolute increases of 0. 0.2, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5, or even one milligram per deciliter. And to make things even more confusing, the time between the initial creatinine determined and the administration of contrast material also varied to as little as one hour to as much as two weeks. All right. So the bottom line then is that there's a whole bunch of different definitions. So we need to take extra care in interpreting these studies. I mean, it sounds like so many things in medicine. You know, also, I think it's important to understand that most of these definitions are simply lab value cutoffs rather than actual patient things that we care about. Exactly. The definition is a biochemical one. Like you said, it's based on just the lab values and that's purely 
disease-oriented outcome, which is really not what we want. We really want to get at the patient-oriented outcomes. And this definition really doesn't translate into any patient-oriented outcomes. Most people don't care if their creatinine is bumped by 0.5 milligrams per deciliter or 44 micromoles per liter for a few days, but they do care about, you know, hemodialysis or death. All right. So all these definitions are kind of confusing. They're all based on lab values instead of real patient-oriented outcomes. So let's start to look at the studies. But before we do that, I think to get real perspective on this issue, we need to start at the beginning. Rory, where did the concept of contrast-induced nephropathy actually come from? Like, how, how was it born? Yeah, so the CIN's origin story, and it goes all the way back to an article published in 1954 in Acta Medica Scandinavica by Bartlett et al. And and this article describes a 69-year-old male that presents with a few months of increasing fatigue and pallor, followed by three to four weeks of left flank pain and fullness. And so he was admitted for a UTI, but during his hospital course, the doctors found albuminuria and an elevated BUN of 81. He underwent an intravenous pilogram and immediately afterwards experienced two days of anuria. And so at that point, the patient was treated with fluid restriction, a low-protein diet, full glucose and oil emulsion, intravenous glucose, and 1% procaine. Now, shockingly, these treatments were ineffective, and the patient's renal failure worsened, and eventually he was transferred to a center that could perform hemodialysis. So on day 12, the patient underwent 10 hours of dialysis with improvement of his numbers. The team continued to try to introduce a feeding tube without success. Finally, a catheter was inserted into his IVC and glucose was infused through it. But I quote, we dare not continue because the temperature of the patient began to rise. And so this is the story that is the basis of our current concepts of contrast-induced nephropathy. Hold on a little bit there, Rory. This is, I I don't know whether to laugh or to cry because this guy had a BUN of 81 prior to even getting the contrast and they stuck a catheter in his IBC. But since the publication of this paper, it seems like the incidence of CIN or post-contrast AKI has shot up. And the question is, is this because of the contrast? Is it more nephrotoxic for some reason? Or are we just ordering more contrast enhanced CT scans? Or alternatively, are we just looking for this entity? Now, those are some good questions. I mean, it sounds like there's a whole host of confounding variables there. Yeah, and this will be a reoccurring theme during out during this whole podcast. The next article I think we should look at is by Mudge, which was published in Kidney International in 1980. And it's essentially a state of the union of the current status of CIN at the time. And the author goes on to describe a number of case reports, which at the time was the totality of the evidence describing CIN. He describes a total of 284 patients in case series from 1955 to 1980, and the number of these cases that required dialysis or went on to die following their CIN was 54. Wow. So that's 19%, and those are patient-oriented outcomes, dialysis, death. That sounds like a big deal to me. Except for it's probably not if you actually look at the type of study. Yeah, remember, this is a collection of case series of patients with the disease in question. And the true denominator here is pretty unclear. So the actual risk of CIN is unknown. An analysis like this will typically overestimate the incident of the events in question because they're highly vulnerable to selection bias. So to get a better idea of the true incidence of CIN and the subsequent sequelae, let's look at some more recent observational cohorts, okay? All right, so these observational cohorts, there's actually a ton of this type of study, but let's just look at a few of them so we can get a sense for what this type of data can tell us. So the, the first paper we'll look at is by Sandsteed. It's in the European Journal of Radiology in 2007, and this is a prospective cohort. They looked at 100 consecutive adult patients who had chronic renal failure, so they had to have a creatinine greater than 97 in, in our units, or 1.1 milligram per deciliter, or you had to have an EGFR of less than 90 mil, milliliters per minute. And all of these patients were undergo- undergoing a contrast-enhanced CT scan. And looking at these patients, the mean creatinine actually went down. So it started at 123 micromoles per liter and went down to 114. But three patients out of 100, so 3%, developed what the authors defined as contrast-induced nephropathy by day three. Now, the good news is all three resolved by day seven without needing any kind of intervention. 
So in contrast to the previous study we talked about with a 19% death or dialysis rate, only 3% developed bad looking lab values, which all resolved without dialysis or anything else. So how can we account for that huge difference, Justin? Yeah, so this is an important EBM kind of concept. And I know that always sounds scary, but this is actually really simple. One study was a case series and the other was a prospective observational trial. And how are those different? The prospective observational trial tries to catch all patients of a certain group. So in this case, all the patients who are exposed to contrast and then watch what happens to them. Compare that to who gets into a case report or a case series. Do you write a case report if you saw a patient, they had a CT, and then they went home with no problem? Of course not. Do you write a case report about a patient who had a mild transient creatinine bump? No. Case reports are reserved for the sickest of the patients, a very select population. So case reports can tell us a bit about new or rare entities, but they can't really provide us with accurate numbers. So our next study is by Schmalfuss et al., and this was published in the International Journal of Cardiology, um, and it was pretty similar to the following study. It was also a prospective cohort, only this time they looked at 876 patients who were undergoing CT angiography. They excluded patients if they had type 1 diabetes, weren't able to discontinue their metformin on the day prior to the CT, or had a creatinine over 150 micromoles per liter, or 1.7 milligrams per deciliter for cardiac CTA, or 176 micromoles per liter, or 2 milligrams per deciliter for peripheral or abdominal CTA. And the mean creatinine in this study was unchanged, and only 1.6% of patients met their definition of contrast-induced nephropathy. So Lauren, are there any other examples of studies that show a similar rate of of contrast-induced nephropathy or PCACI? Yeah, yes, sir, there are. So uh, one was the Connect study. It's from 2010, and it was a retrospective sort of registry study, and it showed about that same rate. So 2.6% overall rate of what they called contrast-induced nephropathy in patients who received iso-osmolar contrast. And what they found is that there was no change in the mean creatinine before and after the contrast. It was 150 micromoles or 1.3 milligrams per deciliter before and after uh, they received the contrast, which is, again, very common in these types of studies studies is that there's really no change in the uh, the serum creatinine or the GFR. And this was an interesting study just because it did look at those who were deemed to be at risk for CIN. So people that had GFRs less than 60 or diabetes or uh, were on nephrotoxic agents. So it specifically tried to catch that group and really didn't find much of anything. All right. So we've talked about these three fairly recent studies. Who wants to take a stab at summarizing the takeaway points from them? So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll try here. Reading not just these three, but all the observational data that I could find, I sort of have four big takeaways here. First of all, the overall rate of acute kidney injury is a lot lower than we saw in those case series. It seems to be a, between maybe 2 and 3%. Although the honest truth is we can control that number a lot in an observational trial by deciding who gets into the trial. I actually think that these numbers are probably still going to be a lot higher than what we would see in real practice. And part of that is because to get into these studies, you had to have a repeat creatinine drawn in the days after your CT scan. But do you order a repeat creatinine on every young patient with an appy that you scan? I definitely don't. So really, these tend to only be patients who are sicker, patients who are going to be admitted to the hospital. So I think in general practice, our numbers are probably even lower than this. Now, another point that kept coming up in these studies is that overall, the mean creatinine seems to remain unchanged. That's I find that very interesting. Why are we only focusing on the few patients that had a bump in their creatinine when overall the creatinine levels don't seem to change? What about the ones where the creatinine actually decreased? Would we say that contrast is helping their kidneys? Or are we just looking at normal fluctuations in, in kidney function that happen on a day-to-day basis, especially in sick patients? But then to wrap it up, the million-dollar question about these studies is, What would have happened to these patients if we hadn't given them contrast? With no control, there's no way that we can know. Yeah, if you remember your internal medicine and surgical rotations in residency, they're they're kind of a far distant memory for me now. You'll probably remember that lots and lots of patients admitted to hospital go into renal failure for a myriad of reasons. 
And this is exactly why uncontrolled studies like the ones we've been talking about can't really distinguish those patients who would have gone into renal failure for whatever reason versus those that go into renal failure because of, of the contrast. Yeah, so the next study really illustrates this point nicely. And it might be my favorite study of this journal jam. And it was published in American Journal of Renterology in 2008. And like the previous study, this was a retrospective chart review. And it enrolled 32,161 patients. Only the, the key concept here is these were patients who did not receive contrast material. They had tried to pick up all patients who had a creatinine measured on five consecutive days over a 10-year period. And the interesting part is the distribution of creatinines was very similar to the cohorts we just discussed that established the existence of CIN. Depending on the definition you use, the rate of AKI was about 10 to 15%. And depending on the definition you used, it ranged widely. For example, if you used a relative change, the patients with a low serum creatinine initially were more likely to develop AKI. But if you use an absolute increase in serum creatinine, the patients who had a high level of baseline serum creatinine were more likely to develop AKI. And I think that, and I think that's really worth emphasizing, Rory, because that's going to come up over and over in these studies. If you have a high creatinine, a bump of 0.5 or 44 in my units really isn't that much, and we should expect it. But if you have a really low creatinine, a change of 25% is nothing. That's within the lab error. So that's going to come up over and over again in these studies. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing, which is really interesting, like you said in the other studies, that the overall creatinine doesn't change in the whole group. And so since in some patients, the creatinine goes up, that obviously means in other patients, the, the creatinine goes down over this period. And, you know, if you looked at these studies from a different perspective, one could argue that contrast is actually renal protective. <laughs> But the important part to note from this study is that if these patients had been given contrast, they surely would have been called CIN. And it's impossible to know whether the contrast is at fault unless we had a control group. Absolutely agree, Rory. Control groups are essential because they offer some kind of reference from which we can judge these, these changes in renal functions. So we really want to know if the changes in creatinine that we're seeing in patients who were given contrast are any different from the changes in creatinine in a group of patients who is similar in every other respect, except for did not get contrast. And really, the ideal way to do this would be to get do a prospective randomized control trial that we all know, these RCTs. But actually, there are no RCTs out there to help us answer this question. So instead, we have to settle for observational studies, which are a little bit less than ideal for getting to the bottom of this question. All right. So to drive home that point, then, controls are important. You know, without controls to compare against, we don't really have any context for the numbers that we're seeing. So let's move on to the trials that do have controls. Um, again, there are tons of these studies. So we just picked a few to illustrate the issues surrounding these types of studies. Uh, Lauren, do you want to kick us off? Sure. This is one that is relevant in the ED because it looked at trauma patients and it was Tremblay and colleagues and it was in 2005. And they looked at trauma patients that came in and got a CT scan um, at a level one trauma center. And they only looked at patients who had a C an admission creatinine greater than 1.3 milligrams per deciliter or 115 millimole micromoles per liter for the rest of the world. Um, and they found uh, 95 patients during that time that got imaging that met those criteria. 56 got contrast and it was iohexol and then 39 were non-contrast CT scans. And the admission creatinine was higher in the non-contrast group versus uh, the group that did get the contrast enhanced CT scans. And the non-contrast group also had more pre-existing renal disease. This could be some uh, indication of selection bias. You're less likely to give contrast material to a patient with renal dysfunction or an elevated creatinine if that's something that you believe in. Um, on the other hand, we don't really know uh, when these uh, scans were ordered, whether it was admission before you got a creatinine or afterwards. We don't have that information to know if that selection bias was at play. Also, the contrast group was a little bit sicker. They had higher injury severity scores. So maybe they were more acutely ill and really just had the indication to get that contrast CT scan. Again, AKI was more common in the non-contrast group uh, than in the contrast group. So the opposite of what we would expect, three patients needed temporary dialysis, one in the contrast, two in the non-contrast group. Not an ideal study. Um, you know, the patients were probably treated a little bit differently here because of their underlying renal dysfunction. So it had a control group, 
but again, not a perfect control group because there's that selection bias. I don't know, Lauren, again, it's looking like that contrast is renal protective to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going to start that trend. Yeah, if you admit me to hospital, I want contrast before I'm admitted. And I think there's one other thing we should point out about the studies. We're going to spend a lot of time in this episode talking about the potential harms of contrast. But if you look at the study, there were two patients with missed intra-abdominal injuries in the non-contrast group as compared to zero in the contrast group. So we're also going to have to think at some points about the benefits that patients get because of contrast and not just its harms. Yeah, I mean, you know, without contrast, there's some things that won't be picked up on CT for sure. Then on the flip side, you've also got to think about allergic reactions with contrast. I don't know. Does anyone know the rate of allergic reactions with IV contrast? If you go according to the uh, American College of Radiologists handbook, they say that an allergic reaction to uh, CT iodine contrast is about 0.6% overall, and only about 0.04% of them would be classified as being severe. And so far, it seems like maybe there's a one or two or maybe 3% of patients who will end up with AKI after receiving IV contrast, but we don't really know if the contrast is the cause or not. I suppose it comes down to this small risk of AKI versus the risk of not doing the CT with contrast and missing an important diagnosis, um, as well as your pretest probability of that important diagnosis. Yeah, I, I think that's about right. But I think we still have got a few more studies to look at before we make a decision. All right, so I guess I can jump in with the next one here. The next one up would be by Olicki uh, et al. It's in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry. And in some ways, this study has a much better control group than than the last one that we looked at. This is a retrospective before and after study. And in 2003, this group made the decision to add a contrast CT angiogram to the routine workup of every single TPA eligible stroke patient that they were working up in their center. What they decided to do was look at the four years before and after that change. And so they look at 201 patients who were given contrast and 77 who weren't. Bottom line is we have a reasonably good control group because both of these groups of patients, we would expect to look very similar. They're both stroke patients potentially eligible for TPA. Now, it was a little bit weird because over just eight years, this site used six different kinds of contrast, uh, but they were all in the same class of contrasts. And like the other studies, adding the contrast had no real effect on the creatinine level. It actually went down a little bit in the group given contrast and the patients who weren't given contrast actually saw a little bump in their creatinine. So overall, there was no difference in what the authors defined as acute kidney injury between the two groups. It was 3% with contrast and 4% without contrast. Yeah. And in this study, the baseline characteristics, sure, they were relatively similar uh, between the groups in this study, but they did look at six different contrasts, which you said is, again, kind of weird. And maybe that throws a wrench in things. Yeah. I mean, that begs the question, are all dyes the same? Justin? Oh, so you had to ask me, eh? So, so this topic could definitely get a little bit complex, and I can't pronounce half the names of these dyes, but I'll try a really quick summary for us. So I think that the simplest answer from all my reading is that most of these dyes seem to have the exact same effect, but there are two that stood out as being potentially worse, and those are iohexol and ioxinglate. And at the most basic level, there seem to be three big groups of contrast. The, the first group is the high osmolar contrast. These are the older older ones, and they had really high osmol load. So the normal serum osmolality is about 290, whereas these were all higher than 1,500. The newer uh, contrasts are all low osmolar contrast, and this is the biggest group by far. This is what we're probably all using most of the time. And then in in recent years, there was a, a new dye added. This is called an iso-osmolar contrast. So it's actually 290 osmoles per liter, same as the serum. And that just has one dye in it. It's iodixinol. And the, the idea is if you give patients less osmoles to deal with, that's less work that the kidneys have to do, and that should be easier on the kidneys. Now, I think there's really only two things that we really need to know from the evidence. Uh, and the first one is that this newest dye, this isoosmolar dye, has been compared in a bunch of RCTs to the low osmolar dyes, and there seem to be identical outcomes. It doesn't seem to do any better. And the second thing that we uh, need to know is that there's been a bunch of RCTs comparing the different types of low osmolar dyes. And even though we generally just talk about contrast, contrast-induced nephropathy, as if all contrasts are the same, it does actually look like two are worse than others. 
So I know this is already way more than any emergency doctor would ever want to know about dyes, but let me just mention one study. There's a network meta-analysis that was done by Beyonde Sakani et al. in the International Journal of Cardiology, and it was looking at 42 different RCTs uh, and comparing these different low osmolar contrasts. And in 10,000 uh, patients, the rate of CIN was about 6% across the board, except with iohexol and aoxiglate where it was 11% statistically and almost certainly clinically uh, significantly worse. So we're going to get back to talking about contrast in general, but we might want to pay attention to the type of dye that we're using in our hospitals. It seems like we should be avoiding isohexol and ioxiglate in particular. Yeah, so the next study we're going to look at is by Heller et al. in the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine, published in 2016. And this was another retrospective chart review, and they looked at all adult patients who were admitted to the hospital who had a creatinine drawn in the emergency department, and it had to be less than 141 micromoles per liter, or 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. And they had to have at least one repeat creatinine measured over the next 96 hours. Now, Overall, there were 6,954 patients in the contrast group and only 909 in the non-contrast group. And, you know, the groups were pretty similar in terms of age, sex, and rates of diabetes, but they didn't really look at anything else. The rates of AKI, which was defined as a 25% relative increase in serum creatinine, was the same in both groups, 8.6% in the contrast group and 9.6% in the group without contrast. Mortality was also the same at about 1.5% in each group. 16 patients needed dialysis, all of which were in the contrast group, but they all had reasons other than the contrast that they might have required dialysis, such as aortic repairs, cabbage, sepsis, etc., So again, we see no difference in the rates of contrast-induced nephropathy. But there's a great deal of potential bias related to the retrospective nature and the non-randomized selection of the control group. Yeah, and again here, we see the major determinant of CIN is not really whether or not you receive contrast, but rather what threshold or what definition we used of CIN. All right, I think I understand this. So coming back to the problem of a variety of definitions and cutoff lab values that we were talking about at the top of the podcast, there's a reasonable possibility that the AKI seen in these studies had nothing to do with the contrast itself, but instead to do with how they defined contrast-induced nephropathy. You know, it's interesting that a few years back, they came up with the so-called risk factors for contrast-induced nephropathy like a history of diabetes or a history of CHF or a creatinine clearance less than 65 or a recent CT contrast study. You know, those were the sort of classic risk factors for contrast-induced nephropathy. But these so-called risk factors might just be risk factors for renal failure patients who are admitted to hospital in general rather than risk factors for contrast-induced nephropathy. Right. I mean, this is, this is almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? I mean, these are, these are the exact risk factors that would make you at risk for acute kidney injury when you were admitted to the hospital in the first place. Exactly. And sort of going into that is a study by Azuz et al. And this study was interesting primarily because they looked at MRI versus CT and then they, those that got contrast MRIs, non-contrast MRIs, CTs that were contrast enhanced versus contrast, non-contrast CT scans. And the the bottom line here is that the rate of contrast-induced nephropathy or AKI afterwards was the same in the MRI groups as it was in the CT groups. So again, it may not be specifically about the contrast, but about something else going on in these studies. And here it was 716 patients, and they actually only found a whopping three patients out of those that had the definition of uh, CIN when it was defined as the 0.5 milligram per deciliter rise or 44 micromole per liter rise. And they found, again, that that rate increased when they used the relative the 25% relative increase. So again, it's interesting if you, you know, save this patient's kidneys and get an MRI, it may not actually be saving their kidneys at all because they may just have been predisposed to get an AKI in general. It's the magnets. It's got to be the magnets. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. The contrast actually helped them. This really is interesting because the whole strategy of using an alternative imaging modality when you decide that the patient's at risk and shouldn't get IV CT contrast, 
you know, it doesn't really make sense based on on this study uh, because like you said, those who got MRI also had the same rate of AKI. You know, it kind of turns on its head the whole idea of choosing a different modality if someone is at risk for contrast-induced nephropathy. Exactly. This study is also sort of worth mentioning for one other point, and it's that everyone got follow-up creatinines in this study versus just those that got hospitalized. Um, in most of the studies on acute kidney injury, you just happen to include those that have the follow-up creatinine at 48 or 72 hours, so they tend to be the hospitalized patients that are going to get sick anyways. Here, they went to actually went to people's houses and got uh, their creatinines there um, or followed them up in the office, and so everyone got a follow-up creatinine. It wasn't as mu- there wasn't as much selection bias at play, but again, they weren't randomized. And, you know, this study really shows the absurdity of the whole thing, right? Because if I, I was joking earlier, but if we thought magnets hurt the kidneys, we would go on and, and order a bunch of repeat creatinines to make sure our kidneys were okay. And then when we saw this natural rise in creatinine that randomly happened in some percentage of the cohort, we would blame the magnets for the renal injury. You know, to say something positive here, it is nice to finally see a prospective study as opposed to a chart review. You know, we're making some EBM progress here, but I can't be too positive about things. You know, we mentioned confounders a number of times in the podcast so far. Rory, can you just clarify for our listeners what you mean by confounders? And second, what can be done to deal with them aside from doing an airtight prospective RCT? Yeah, so confounders are variables that cause non-random error or bias. And and we've talked about bias in previous Journal Jam episodes, but essentially it's any non-random variable that deviates our observed results away from the underlying truth. Okay, so just to repeat that, confounders are any non-random variable that deviates our observed results away from the underlying truth. All right. right. I'm following you so far. Go on. Right. So the presence or extent of bias or non-random error is far harder to quantify than random error. And an example of this is the p-value that we see in most studies. And it's essentially a method to quantify random error. Its results tell us the likelihood of the observed results occurring by random chance. But there's no good method to measure non-random error. So instead, we have to try to control for it as best as possible. Now, as you said, randomization is the only way to truly control for non-random error, but there are statistical methods that attempt to ensure that the groups are similar in all ways but the variable in question, in this case, the administration of contrast. The technique that's used in many of the studies examining the existence of CIN is called propensity matching. Propensity matching. Well, how how the heck does propensity matching actually control for the non-random bias that you're talking about? So propensity score analysis or propensity matching attempts to quantify how baseline features are associated with the treatment allocation in question in the hopes that such a technique will eliminate all possible imbalances between the groups when subjects with similar propensity scores are compared. And so what this involves is first identifying variables that predict the likelihood that a patient will receive the treatment in question. So in this case, contrast. And after you identify these risk factors, you build a model that can be derived with increasing scores representing an individual's increased likelihood of receiving contrast. And so once individual scores have been generated for all patients in the data set, a patient with similar scores can be matched for for those who did and did not receive contrast. And patients without scores that are matching are discarded. And the assumption here is that if you match patients with similar scores, all the potential bias that would deviate our our results from the truth will be eliminated. All right. So what you're saying is the best way to deal with the horrid bias that confounders introduce into a study is to do a proper prospective RCT. But if you can't do that, the next best thing is propensity score analysis. I understand that there are a few studies out there on post-contrast renal injury that actually use this propensity scoring. What did those studies show? Yeah, so again, there's a number of these studies, but for the sake of time, we're just going to grab a few to illustrate how this idea of propensity matching works. And the first one to look at is by McDonald uh, in Radiology 2014. And this is a, a large chart review, and they looked at 21,346 patients who had a CT done, and they compared the patients who had contrast to those who had no contrast. Now, like a lot of the studies above, to get into the study, you had to have a creatinine measured both in the 24 hours before your CT scan, and then sometime in the the period 24 to 72 hours after the scan. 
And they used a chart to gather a lot of data on these uh, patients. And using that data, they matched patients one-to-one based on one of these propensity scores that Rory was just telling us about. So in the end, they have two different groups, one group that received contrast, one group that didn't, and each patient should have a matched patient in the opposite group that should be very similar in terms of everything else that the authors could think about. Now, they used a more traditional definition of contrast-induced nephropathy, not the akin definitions, because they raise an important point. If you use the really low cutoff, uh, just a 25% increase in creatinine, you catch a lot of people, and they tell us that they think that that definition is probably not specific enough. You get a lot of false positives. So they look specifically at a 44 micromole per liter or a 0.5 milligram per deciliter increase to be defined as CIN. And overall, the rate of acute kidney injury was 5%, and it was the same whether or not you got contrast. And again, we don't really want to focus on these disease-oriented outcomes. So looking at patient-oriented outcomes, they were also exactly the same. Emergent dialysis was the same in both groups. Mortality, it was also the same between both groups. Now, there's one other little thing about this study that I found really interesting. There is a group within this study, 4,000 patients or so, that both had a contrast study and a non-contrast study that were at least 14 days apart from each other, so they were able to act as their own controls. And again, there was no difference between when they got the contrast and when they didn't get the contrast in whether they were going to develop CIN or not. All right, so this one study that used propensity matching didn't show a difference. Are there any other studies that use this propensity matching? Yeah, so the next one is by Davenport and all, and it was published in Radiology in 2013. And this, again, is a retrospective chart review, and they took over 10,000 patients who had a contrast and half CT and matched them with patients who underwent a non-contrast CT. And they included patients who had a creatinine measured within five days before the CT scan and at least one creatinine in the 72 hours after the scan. And their primary outcome overall was the rate of acute kidney injury, which was exactly the same in both groups, about 8%. Now, they do report a subgroup, which was the patients with a baseline creatinine of greater than 141 micromoles per liter, or 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. And in this group, they noted an increase in acute kidney injury in the patients that received contrast. And it was 26% versus 20%. And they cite a p-value of 0.03. Now, at first, you could think, finally, we have some sign of contrast-induced nephropathy. Remember, this is one subgroup in a massive study of 10,000 patients. And like we've talked about in the past, doing a subgroup analysis without predefining these subgroups, you're bound to find some differences just by chance alone. And so what we have here is one subgroup in a huge study out of another dozen or so studies we've already looked at and we finally find a difference, I would say without being able to replicate this, this is probably more likely due to chance alone. And Rory, I throw in there, in the study by McDonald that we just talked about, they looked at that same subgroup and there was no difference. And in the study that Lauren's going to talk to us about in a second, they also look at the subgroup of patients with chronic renal failure and there was no difference. So this is is one out of multiple studies where we're seeing a positive. If you really want to focus on subgroups, though, they will tell you that there was absolutely no acute kidney injury if you had a baseline creatinine less than 130. So maybe focus on that subgroup instead. Right, exactly. I mean, if there was no difference overall and one subgroup did worse, then you would have to think another subgroup did better. So the next study we're going to talk about was the one that I actually paid most attention to because it was ED-based and also because it was such a huge study. And this was, for me, the study that kind of got me rethinking contrast-induced nephropathy altogether. So Lauren, could you just tell me a little bit about the paper that came out in Annals of Emergency Medicine this year? Sure. And you're not alone there. This is the paper that sort of finally caught the attention of the emergency provider. It was the piece de resistance. Um, it was a huge chart review study. Almost 18,000 adult emergency department patients were included. And they included patients that similarly to prior studies, they got two creatinine measurements, one before the CT scan and at least one 48 to 72 hours later. So again, a little bit of selection bias here. They also used propensity score matching and they compared the group Group. Interestingly, they got a contrast enhanced CT scan with both those who received a non contrast CT scan, which we've seen frequently, 
as well as with those who received no CT scan at all. And shocker, the incidence of acute kidney injury, essentially the same in all groups. It was between 7 and 10%. It was about 7% in one of the definitions of AKI. And in the, the less stringent definition of AKI, it was more like 10%. Uh, few people got dialysis. It was 0.5%. And then 0.1% had a kidney transplant. Patient-oriented outcomes but again, contrast didn't seem to make a difference in any of those patient-oriented outcomes. So this, we like this article a lot, I think, as emergency providers because it's the strongest ED-based data that we have. But again, even though they had pretty strong methods, used city score matching, it is a retrospective study and it is a single institution. And without randomization, it's hard to kind of really control for things. There are confounders and the authors did a good job of mentioning like, hey, providers did seem to alter their behavior based on the GFR or the baseline creatinine of the patients. So patients that had a baseline creatinine that was really high, they were less likely to order a contrast enhanced CT scan and more likely to give them fluids if they did. So behaviors just mattered a little bit um, with regards to ordering those CT scans. So far, we've been talking about individual studies and none of which have been randomized control trials. I understand that there's been a couple of systematic reviews published that kind of sum up all the studies for us. And we're fortunate enough to have the author of one of these studies with us on the Journal Jam podcast, Lauren. This is great. So, Lauren, could you give us the insider's take on the systematic review that recently got published uh, in the Annals of Emergency Medicine? Sure. The inside take is in my emergency department, we have to sign consent for contrast enhanced CT scans on anybody with a GFR less than 60. So even if their GFR is 59, I have to walk over to CT and sign consent or my residents do more commonly. And according to the American College of Radiology, that's not even the range in which we should be worried about renal injury. They call that maybe less than 30 as the GFR if you really want to worry about a specific number. And it gets kind of cumbersome. So it didn't really match up with a lot of the studies that I read. So I, I just wanted to look into it a little bit more. So we did this systematic review and meta-analysis, and we looked specifically at sort of what would matter in the emergency department. So CT scans, not procedural stuff, and looked at groups that had a control group. So contrast enhanced CT scans to those that compared them to non-contrast CT scans. And we included 26 studies. Unfortunately, all of them were observational, uh, disappointing, but what we had to work with. And what we wanted to know is incidence of AKI, which is what is always reported, but also the patient-oriented stuff. So the need for renal replacement therapy or hemodialysis and also death. And unsurprisingly, like all the other studies, we found no difference between the groups. And we even tried to parse these out um, in some subgroup analyses that we specified a priori, like did it matter what type of contrast they use, whether it was low osmolar or isosmolar, it didn't. What population the patient was, whether it's an ED or ICU or trauma patient, also didn't matter. Or which definition of AKI did they use? And really, that didn't matter either very much. Not super high quality evidence because, you know, it's only as good as the studies we included, which were retrospective, oftentimes some perspective, but all observational. But it gave us a little bit of insight into sort of the breadth of literature that's out there, again, showing that at least the way we order CT scans, contrast doesn't really seem to make a difference in AKI. It's probably something else. This is a brilliant paper, but there is the core EBM concept here that we've been saying all, all the way along. You can do an incredibly good systematic review and meta-analysis, follow everything to a T and still not provide us with any better an answer because it's the old garbage in, garbage out. If the papers you're working with aren't great, you're going to be left with something that's not great at the end. And even though this is a fantastic paper, it's what we've been saying all the way along. The control groups used here are full of confounders. It could really swing either way. I think this data is equally likely to show us that contrast is protective to our kidneys as it is to be harmful. It's really, really hard to say just because it's so hard to say which patients are getting into each of these groups. 
Just to add something and not to, to toot Lauren's horn here, I yeah. think this was an important study because it really just showed the quantity of evidence we really have, which is next to nothing. I think a lot of us, you know, when we before we dived into this thought, well, well, maybe, you know, there was older contrast and we use more of it. Maybe there truly was a contrast in nephropathy. But as we, we progressed and got better with our scans and giving lowered boluses and using a, a different form of contrast, things got safer. But from my perspective, looking at all this, there's just no evidence it ever existed in the first place. I'm quite sure this is all apophenia and we're just kind of reading random numbers and picking up the ones where they, they happen to have some AKI and attributing that to the contrast. Here comes the EBM bomb. Hi, it's Anton Nicklein again with another EBM bomb. Today, we're covering selection bias. Selection bias is the inherent bias that occurs when choosing groups or samples for a study. To mitigate this bias, we want to make sure the groups are as similar as possible so other variables aren't skewing the outcomes measured. In the example of patients getting contrast versus no contrast, we want to make sure that other factors such as age, sex, kidney function, and other comorbidities don't play into the final interpretation. If only patients with normal kidney function got contrast, well, it wouldn't really make sense to compare a change in creatinine. It'd be like comparing apples to oranges and making a conclusion about all fruits. We want to, as best we can, say the groups are similar enough to draw a reasonable conclusion. In a perfect world, we would just randomize patients to the groups. But in reality, what we're left with are large tables and studies comparing demographic data and stating statistical significance. It's still important to look through these tables and decide for yourself, did they reasonably account for all possible variables between the groups? Were the variables statistically significant? And how might this affect the conclusion of the study? Or better yet, how does this affect your own conclusion about the study? And that's been your one-minute EBM bomb. Before we get to our final conclusions on this Journal Jam podcast, I'd like to discuss four concepts that can help us not only understand this topic better, but understand a lot of topics in emergency medicine better. We're going to get a little bit EBM nerdy here, but these four concepts are one, association versus causation, two, signal versus noise, three, disease versus patient-oriented outcomes, and four, ignoring the harms of not giving contrast. So, Justin, let's start with the notion of association versus causation. How does it relate to this topic and how does it relate to topics in general in emergency medicine that we should be looking for? So it's such a key concept, and I'll just start by throwing down some Latin, which I cannot pronounce, so I'm sorry, but post hoc ergo propter hoc. So just because Y follows X doesn't mean that X caused Y. But clinically, really, this is how we think about contrast, right? A patient comes in and develops acute kidney injury right after they were given contrast, and so the contrast is blamed. But why was the patient getting the scan in the first place? We don't just scan healthy patients. Well, Maybe some of us do, maybe a little bit more south of the border, but mostly, <laughs> but mostly patients are getting CT scans. That was below the belt. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you can cut that out if you want. We have two on, two on right now. We got to make it's fun fair. of them somehow. It's, no, it's, it's totally true. I'm laughing only because it's true. Yeah. But really, mostly patients are getting CT scans because they're sick. And who develops renal failure? Sick people do. And this is why there is a shift away from the term contrast-induced nephropathy, because contrast-induced nephropathy, it assumes implicitly that the contrast is what's at fault. But there are so many other things that could be contributing to that acute kidney injury. It could be their shock, the patient's sepsis, maybe the medications that we're giving them or surgery, so many different things. All we know is that some people develop acute kidney injury after being given contrast. Because all the studies are observational, we really can only comment that there's an association, cannot say anything about causation, so really shouldn't even be saying anything about contrast induced because we don't know what's causing it. So again, all studies are observational, can't distinguish association from causation. This is why we're calling it post-contrast acute kidney injury and not CIN typically, because we can't distinguish between the two. 
Right. And I think we should point out that in most of these studies, there isn't even an association. The rate of kidney injury was the same whether or not you got contrast. Now, in order to sort this out, we really need an RCT. We really want two groups of patients that are identical in all respects, except whether they were given contrast. That's really the only way we're going to know for sure. So that leads us to the next discussion point. When we're picking out these few patients that have elevated creatinines, are we seeing signal or noise? Yeah. Imagine you took a thousand patients and measured their creatinine every day for a week. What would you expect to see? The numbers wouldn't be identical every day. There would be variance, partly because of lab inaccuracy and partly because of the normal biological variance. But the numbers will change. So some will go up and some will go down, but the mean should stay about the same. And this is exactly the pattern we saw in most of these studies. While some patients went up and some went down, the mean stayed the same. This is sort of crazy. Imagine 10% of the stocks in your portfolio went up today. That would be awesome. But if you're ignoring the other 10% that went down by the exact same amount, you're sort of missing the bigger picture. Right. And even more importantly, we know the day-to-day variation of creatinine in people with baseline renal failure is much larger than those in normal renal function. So that means that we should expect larger numbers of people with chronic renal failure to have higher creatinines if we decide to recheck them in one or two days, which is exactly what we see in these studies. There is more variation in the patients with a low GFR, but there is a good chance that that is normal biological variance rather than acute kidney injury. And this is also the reason that some people have a problem with the akin definition of acute kidney injury, because an increase in creatinine by 27 or 0.3 in American numbers is really likely in people with chronic renal failure. It's less specific. It increases false positives. All right, y'all. Y'all are talking a lot about creatinine, but I got to ask you, do either of you really care what your creatinine is right now? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I think I know what you're trying to get at here. What you're telling us is we should move on to our next discussion point, the difference between disease-oriented and patient-oriented outcomes. Exactly. And to me, this is the most important issue. And when we talk about contrast, we are almost always talking about changes in creatinine or changes in GFR. And most of the time, the changes that we are talking about are transient. It goes up for a few days and goes back to normal. But our patients, do they care about it at all? Probably not. That's what we call a disease-oriented outcome. It looks at physiologic or surrogate markers of disease like a lab value that the patient will probably never, ever, ever notice. What we really should be talking about are the patient-oriented outcomes, things that will change the length or quality of a patient's life, which is theoretically why we all went to med school. Yeah, and this is tricky. We said that most studies didn't show an association between contrast and acute kidney injury, but that the control groups were flawed. And the same is to be said for the patient-oriented outcome. Things like death or dialysis, the numbers are similar whether or not you got contrast. But again, there are too many problems with the data to say that contrast doesn't cause these issues for sure. But I think there is one thing that we can say pretty definitively. If there is an increase, it's small. I think the numbers from the Hinson paper are the best for our purpose because it was an emergency department cohort. And in this study, 2 to 4% had chronic kidney disease at six months. 0.5% had dialysis and 0.1% had a kidney transplant. Now, these were the same in both groups, but even if you decide to blame the contrast, which I'm not sure you would, the chance of a true patient-oriented harm is very, very low. And to run our discussion, we can't talk about the harms of contrast without considering its benefits or the harms of not using it. And the honest truth is I can't get any great numbers here, but we use contrast for a reason. And in the Tremblay study, as I mentioned, there were two patients who had missed intra-abdominal injuries after trauma in the non-contrast group and zero in the contrast group. So if we avoid contrast and miss stuff, we aren't helping our patients. How often have you been talked into a VQ scan when you were pretty sure a CTPA was going to be the better choice just because of baseline renal function? How many times have you done a non-contrast scan of the belly when it probably would have been a good idea to get some contrast into that aorta? And then the other harm to consider is logistical harm. Right now, at this minute, across North America, how many patients are sitting in an emergency department waiting for their creatinine to come back so they can get their CT scan done? This way can lead to a delay in important diagnosis, but it's also just logistically bad. It leads to crowding of our already overloaded departments. It leads to more handovers and all those potential errors there. 
So although it's possible, maybe even plausible, that contrast could cause acute kidney injury, the evidence really isn't there to support that claim. And if it does occur, true patient-oriented harms are rare, and we seem to almost never talk about the balance, the benefits of contrast. Looking at this data now, it seems to me that the risks are so low, they shouldn't even kind of measure in your decision-making, because if you're worried enough to go get the study, contrast shouldn't factor in at all. I think a lot of people order CT scans when when they don't think a patient has the disease process. So Rory, you might just be on a little bit different plane than unfortunately many clinicians who are ordering many, many, many CT scans when they could have done something else like, you know, abide the well score and perk or even D-dimer to patient. Right. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion that I don't think we're going to fix tonight. Yeah, but it's a really important point. So what we might be emphasizing here is that we've probably been really oversold the idea that contrast is causing harms. That doesn't mean that everybody should just go out tomorrow and give contrast to all 30 patients they see on their shift tomorrow, right? We still need to decide which patients need which scans, which tests are going to change our management. But once you've decided that the patient needs a scan, this data all leads me to believe that we should not be worried about the contrast at all. All right, so we've gone through all the studies on whether or not CT contrast causes acute kidney injury, and the take-home message seems to be that while there may or may not be a very weak association, there certainly is no good evidence for causation. Um, A small percentage of patients will end up with AKI after getting IV contrast for a variety of other reasons, probably not related to the contrast. So then we have a few questions that remain. First is, when should we not do a scan on patients with renal dysfunction in the ED? Second is, what should we tell patients if we think the scan should be done? And thirdly, is there anything worth doing to try to prevent acute kidney injury, like giving fluids or NAC or bicarb or whatever, or holding the patient's metformin, for example? So let's start off with that first question is, you know, when should we not do a scan on patients with renal dysfunction in the ED? I'm I'm going to take this one because it's the easiest out of the three questions to answer. Um, and I think it's it's pretty simple. When the patient doesn't need a scan, they shouldn't get a scan. But if they do need a CAT scan with contrast, I don't think renal dysfunction should factor into your decision. Rory took the words out of my mouth. I give the same answer. Agreed. No matter how bad their kidney dysfunction is, eh? If the patient needs contrast to make the diagnosis, if you're thinking about an aorta, if you're thinking about something important, you give them contrast. It doesn't matter what their renal function is. All right. So we're all in agreement about that. Then the second question is, what should we tell patients if we think the scan should be done when you know they have to sign this piece of paper in some departments or the radiologist is saying that they have to watch out for acute kidney injury or telling them to stop their metformin, et cetera? What should we tell patients, Justin? Yeah, so this one's always a little bit trickier, but overall, this is probably the most important thing to come up with, a a good script. Because we know this is going to be new, and we know that people have been talking about contrast as a very big issue for a long time. And so when a patient gets sick, and we know that there are patients who are going to develop acute kidney injury, what's going to happen is you're going to get fingers pointed at you. So everybody needs to be on the same page before the scan gets done. Uh, So I don't have a perfect script worked out. But I just tell my patients exactly what we've talked about today. I tell them, we're doing the CT scan for a reason. We're looking for something that I think is making you sick. Now, in the past, we really used to think that the contrast we use in these scans might hurt kidneys. But actually looking at all the science on this issue, it actually looks like anybody who's sick, whether or not we do the CT scan, could develop kidney injury. So what you need to know is that you're going to go through this CT scan. And in a few days, you might have some kidney problems. I don't think that that was because of the CT scan, but either way, you need to know that there's a risk in a few days that you could develop some kidney injury. And I think as long as you've had that conversation, as long as you're on the same page, and as long as the patients and their families understand, you're not going to get in trouble. Yeah, I I tend to agree with Justin. I think, you know, in the ideal world where we all believe that contrast-induced nephropathy was a myth, we wouldn't really have to say anything to the patients other than you really need this study and contrast is going to help us get the diagnosis we want. But, you know, we all work in academic centers where there's more or less belief in this entity. And in those cases, I think you have to do what Justin did, explain the risks, explain the benefits, and explain why we think contrast is important. Yeah, or we're literally being 
forced to have the discussion because we have to sign a piece of paper saying that the patient is okay with getting the contrast. Right. And, you know, I, I actually think this is probably the only reason to do the RCT. Um, from all this data, I, I don't think, you know, it's worth wasting the resources on RCT since it doesn't seem that this entity exists. So the only real reason is to convince our colleagues that we no longer have to have this paper signed. And that's why I I have this conversation a lot with the admitting provider that I'm talking to, just so they don't go back and tell the patient that it's the CT scan that did this. I have this conversation when I'm admitting them to the ICU or wherever, like, I scan them, even though their GFR is horrendous. By the way, this probably isn't a real thing. I'm happy to send you some papers on this. Each one of the radiologists that I spoke to about this has an active ongoing lawsuit from a patient who had quote unquote contrast induced nephropathy. So having some science to back up that this doesn't exist would really, really help them. And part of the reason they give us a hard time is because they're getting hit pretty hard from this. And this is in Canada where doctors really don't get sued nearly as much. Uh, that's scary and unfortunate. I think we do have the science. And I, I think if everyone got together and, and looked at this data and said, hey, this thing doesn't exist, we wouldn't have to have that conversation. But since, you know, it's still an accepted entity in the American College of Radiology and so forth, I think we then have to go on and have this discussion. All right. So that's the first two questions. When should we not do a scan on patients with renal dysfunction in the ED? And what what we should tell patients if we think the scan should be done? The next question is, should we be doing anything to try and prevent acute kidney injury in patients who are getting a scan, whether it's from a contrast or not? You know, our protocol at our hospital is to give fluids before the scan and then after the scan if their GFR is low. Uh, It used to be that we gave NAC or even bicarb used to be part of the protocol. They got rid of that. Maybe the good thing that has come out of all this data is that we should be just paying more attention to patients with a low GFR and be careful to do kidney-friendly treatments. Well, I think that that's hitting the head on the nails. The the way to prevent post-contrast acute kidney injury is by not ordering the scan if you don't need it or not ordering the contrast if you can get away without it, if, if, if it's really not that important, and then just not giving them nephrotoxic medications or, um, you know, letting, letting the inpatient team know that you think that they're at risk for developing an AKI for some reason. As far as fluids and other things, the NAC and the bicarb and all of those things, I haven't been convinced by the data at all, including a randomized control trial, the macing trial this year on fluids. Um, we have some protocols that are occasionally adopted at our hospital, uh, but not stringently followed. So I haven't been convinced by that. I just think it's good kidney care in general, like you said. Yeah, absolutely. I I think in terms of prevention here, nothing seems to consistently work. And that makes a lot of sense if CIN doesn't actually exist. You can't prevent something that doesn't exist. But I'd actually take a step step back and maybe take this even further. I, I think our focus on contrast is doing a disservice to our patients. Because Really, all these studies told us that every single one of these patients was at risk of acute kidney injury. So why are we only focusing on the patients who are getting contrast? That doesn't make any sense. All of these patients are at risk. So I think this data reminds us we need to take the kidneys seriously. And whether or not you're getting contrast, these patients are at risk. And maybe these patients need to have their fluids assessed, whether the fluids are going to help or not. Assess their fluid level. Assess whether they're on nephrotoxic medications. If metformin is a problem with contrast. Well, guess what? It's going to be a problem with all these patients, not just with contrast. Now we can come back to that in an issue. Contrast or not, the issue seems to be there. And I think making a contrast specific policy is a little bit silly. I think when you're chasing a ghost, no matter what you randomize patients into, you're not going to find a difference because the entity you're trying to prevent doesn't even exist. I would go a step farther and say you might actually be hurting some patients. I, you know, kidneys don't always like 200 to 300 milliliters of normal saline an hour, um, where you can quite quickly get someone fluid overloaded. So I would say in some cases, you might actually be doing harm in an attempt to prevent damage. Justin, you had mentioned metformin. You know, part of my hospital's protocol for giving IV contrast is to hold the metformin for a couple of days after the CT, um, as well as checking the patient's renal function a couple of days later. Uh, when it comes to holding the metformin, why do they suggest this? I mean, what's the evidence for holding it in terms of patient outcomes? Yeah, so I thought this is a common misconception. What we tend to think about is that we're holding the metformin to protect the kidneys. 
But metformin does not contribute to acute kidney injury or CIN. Direct quote from the American College of Radiologies, patients taking metformin are not at higher risk than other patients for post-contract acute kidney injury. So really, the only reason we're telling patients to hold their metformin is because we're concerned about this thing called metformin-induced lactic acidosis. Now, we could really get into the weeds here. This actually might be a good topic for another journal jam, because depending on who you talk to, it's not even clear whether that is an entity that exists. This is sounding awfully similar to contrast-induced nephropathy. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea overall is metformin is bad if you are in acute renal failure because you don't want it to build up in your system. It might cause lactic acidosis. Again, I actually don't think that that's the truth, but if you really want to understand it, it's not for the kidneys themselves. It's not going to make the creatinine go higher, which brings me back to my previous point. If metformin is bad in a patient who's getting contrast, it's also bad in any of these sick patients who are going to get admitted to hospital because they're all at risk of the exact same acute kidney injury. All right. So I guess suffice to say with metformin that it really has nothing to do with the contrast-induced nephropathy. It may, although we're not sure about the evidence, induce lactic acidosis. Um, And so for now, it's probably wise to hold the metformin in really any patient who has poor renal function that's going to be admitted to hospital from your ED. Thanks for having me on. It was a a lifetime goal Uh, achieved uh, since I was right before my first year of med school. Sweet on you.